Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name is Brian from Kingdom Hearts and Cross Nation. And for today, we have a huge news roundup in regards to the whole USA uh, loot box bill that has been somewhat of a hot topic as of recently. Now, if you aren't aware, ever since my last video covering the subjects, Basically, three things have happened since then. A, an interview between Jason Schreier from Kotaku and Senator Hawley, uh, who made the bill in the first place, okay? An uh, interview between them has occurred, which I'll be covering towards the end of this video. Second, the bill has been gaining bipartisan support, which for those of you who don't know what the heck that means, and I didn't either until I had to look it up. <laughs> Uh, that means that the bill is getting support from both political parties, okay? So both Democrats and Republicans so far. And a third thing that has happened since then is the fact that the bill itself has been uh, made public for everyone to go ahead and read. For those of you that are interested, I'll be leaving a link to all, any articles and the bill itself down below in case you want to check that out. I've already gone ahead and read through the bill myself. It's about 18 pages, but it's a fairly short read, to be honest. You can finish it in like five, 10 minutes fairly easily. I made a few clip notes though, as to the important things you actually need to know about this bill, uh, based on what was said, as well as like any of the implications that would result from this as well. But starting off, we're gonna just quickly go over the important parts of the bill itself uh, that you guys should be aware of. For the most part, uh, about half of the bill was just defining terms like, what is a loot box? What is a microtransaction? What is pay to win? Things of that nature, okay? Uh, about a fourth of it was going into like, what are the fees that the Federal Trade Commission would implement on gaming companies that violate like these rules and stuff like that. And then the last fourth of it was the actual stuff that was that we care about that we actually that's actually relevant for what can you can can or cannot do in terms of you know loot boxes and pay to win stuff so starting off on page two line five this is the section where they are declaring like what is illegal for game publishers to do for their games the first part is saying that uh basically you're not allowed to have loot boxes or micro or pay to win microtransactions um, as far as it, but line five, as well as they kind of iterate this throughout the rest of the bill as well, uh, gives the sense that n on top of the fact that you can't have loot boxes or pay to win microtransactions within the game itself when it comes out, but you're not allowed to update the game to contain these things at a later date either. Now I know that's kind of a small thing, it's not the biggest change in the world, but it is important enough to be worth noting just because of the fact that, for those of you that keep up with gaming news, um, this sort of thing in terms of updating it with trip microtransactions or store later on in the future after launch has started becoming quite a bit of a trend uh, as of late the what the last year or so um, primarily because of the fact that initially for those of you that are unaware initially when games came out with the store already intact people were giving games negative reviews just because of the fact it had these uh, very manipulative practices in order to get you to uh, purchase from whatever shop or microtransactions they had in the game. Okay, it was there to encourage you to do that. Um, and mo most games tend to be very shameless about it too. And many gamers these days are increasingly getting more and more fed up with this type of practice that's going on in the gaming industry as of right now, okay? So when games came out that had these type of uh, features in their games, players would normally just give them negative reviews and be like, this is a crap game, just don't do it, it's annoying, blah, blah, blah. So one tactic that the gaming industry was starting to do is that they would release the games uh, without their stores or any microtransaction features available at first, okay? They would wait until the game reviews come out for it because they'll more likely have positive reviews because they don't have the microtransactions in them yet. And then once the reviews came out and they had positive reviews, then they would release their microtransactions and stores uh, into the game. It's still kind of a scummy tactic, but that's the whole reason why this little addition into uh, that bill is important and worth noting uh, just because of 
the latest practices that, that have been happening within the gaming industry. Now, one of the things that the bill also states is that it is unlawful for a game publisher to publish an interactive, basically a video game, that is not a minor oriented game or an update to such a product if A, such a product or update contains pay to win microtransactions or loot boxes and the publisher has constructive knowledge that any of its users are under the age of 18. Now, this is a very, very big one uh, in terms of the important stuff to note out about this bill. Just because of the fact that if, if you recall from my last video covering about the topic, I did go into what are the potential effects that having different age ratings could have in terms of video games and, you know, uh, pay to win loot boxes and all that stuff like that in terms of how games would be approached from that point afterwards. And what this small line does right there to hold that is basically if you notice that it doesn't actually label any particular age rating uh, within that sentence. It, it doesn't actually say anything of the sort like, oh, any players that don't fit the rated M rating for the game uh, can't have loot box or stuff like that. No, it says that it says that if the publisher has constructive knowledge that any of its users are under the age of 18 playing the game. So in a way, it's almost like saying if your target audience are minors, whether or not the actual game itself is rated as a mature game or not, or you know, an 18 plus game, 21 plus game or not, as long as the target audience are minors, regardless of the game's rating, then that game is also subject to uh, being not allowed to have loot boxes and pay to win features and such. A very good example of this sort of thing that I'm talking about right here is the Call of Duty franchise that we're all familiar with. Call of Duty games typically tend to have a rated M uh, ESRB rating label attached to them just because of the fact that it has uh, violence and swearing in them and such but we all know <laughs> we all know that the Call of Duty series are just littered with little kids with like teenagers and stuff who just ask their parents to buy it for them uh, to play them and things. It, it is a perfect example of a rated M franchise uh, that still in a way is appealing to minors uh, to want to play. So basically, almost for the most part, the ESR rating labels uh, on that you see on most video games are just completely irrelevant and don't apply to which games can or cannot actually have uh, loot boxes and pay to win features in, in them at all, okay? The only possible exception would actually be the adults only rated label. Uh, that the ESRB has for a game. Now, the only problem with this is the fact that, well, most games don't have <laughs> the adult-only rating label on it, strictly because of the fact that pretty much almost all major uh, gaming platforms that most players use these days don't allow adult-only games on their platforms. So, for example, the Apple App Store doesn't allow it, the Google Play Store doesn't allow it, the PlayStation Store doesn't allow it, Xbox games don't allow it, Nintendo doesn't allow it for sure. Those were pretty much all six of the most used, most common gaming platforms that exist at the moment uh, that players play and consume their games on. So because of the fact that the largest gaming platforms don't allow adult-only rated games on their platforms in the first place already discourages most gaming companies to develop uh, adult-only games in at all in the first place. So even though the build doesn't technically outright ban loot boxes and pay-to-win, uh, features just due to the fact of how restrictive it is and how unlikely it is that developers will want to make adult adult only games uh at all in the first place from that point onwards you might as well just straight up just be banning loot boxes and, and pay to win features now the last thing worth noting about the bill is the fact that the bill explicitly states uh what does not count as loot boxes or pay to win features or basically what what are the few exceptional things that um are considered are still considered legal for gaming companies to do 
uh, in terms of microtransactions for their game. Uh, the first of them being uh, difficulty mode. So basically, if a game comes out with a new uh, game mode for the game for you to partake in, directly purchasable cosmetic items are a lot are still allowed to be purchased as well. And the last thing to note are uh, actual DLC, like legitimate DLC for you to purchase, such as. Uh, such as the Final Fantasy 15 story, additional storylines that they've added recently, or the upcoming Kingdom Hearts 3 uh, storyline DLC that should be coming fairly soon. These sort of things are still going to be okay to be purchasable uh, within games themselves as microtransactions. Now with these things in mind, it raises the question, well, since... <laughs> Basically, all games are going to be hit by this, uh, and it's pretty much more or less straight up banning pay to win features and loot boxes. What does that mean for the future of Kingdom Hearts Union Cross? Okay. For the most part, it's pretty much going to end up going one of two ways. Uh, the first one being that, like I mentioned in my last video covering the topic, that A, the game might just be straight up shut down. Um, just due to the fact that the Union Cross game as of right now is just so, so dependent on banners and pulling on four medals and such. Like literally, the shop is more or less the core part of the entire game. The game itself would probably not even be able to function properly without... <laughs> without the store. So it's very possible that they just could just straight up just shut down Union Cross entirely. The second alternative route, which does have some hope of happening, is the fact that they might actually choose to just completely rework the core essentials of the game itself. Um, maybe label it under a new name and advertise it under a new name. So similar to how Kingdom Hearts Kai the uh, browser game as well as the first phase of the app was called Kai, but then later its name changed to Union Cross and was marketed as such. Uh, something similar could happen as well where the game will no longer be called Union Cross, it will be called something else, the actual game mechanics in the game, um, or at least like how you obtain medals might change. But the actual app itself will stay the same. Uh, you'll still retain everything that you've purchased up till then and such. Um, just certain features would end up being drastically altered in order to correspond with the bill. This is kind of the second route uh, that people are hoping. And there is a chance that this might happen. I don't know how likely it is to happen. Truthfully for me, I see it more likely that the game will just completely shut down in the first place. Just purely based off uh, Square Enix's previous track record, uh, specifically with what happened to Belgium, where they shut, they completely banned loot boxes themselves as well, and they just shut down Union Cross in their country. Uh, I see it very possible just happening on all front too. Uh, Square Enix might just consider it too costly to completely rework the game and just shut it down. But, but, but let's just say for the sake of uh, Devil's Advocate or, you know, for the sake of hope, what if they did change the game? Why would they want to do it? Well, the first reason that I can think of, of why they would want to do it is A, in order to help continue the storyline and stuff like that, the franchise, uh, up until anyways their next few Kingdom Hearts major uh, game titles come out for consoles. Um, and the second reason why I think we'll do it is strictly because of the fact that the uh, loot box and pay to win features would no longer be available to them in the first place across any game or platform that they choose, that they're going to have to start making uh, new business decisions and uh, business models for all the games that involve those sort of things anyways that they just might choose to rework Union Cross and continue it as much as they can and kind of just see where it goes from there. This is a possibility. I don't know how likely it is that that would happen compared to them just shutting it down, but it's still a possibility. So now last but not least before I end today's video, I want to quickly go over the interview that happened between Jason Schreier and Senator Hawley who presented the bill in the first place uh, just because there were some fairly interesting 
questions and answers that I feel like are worth going over. Um, and for the sake of the writer, I'm only gonna be going over the ones that I found the most important. Uh, but if you wanna go ahead and check out the rest of the interview itself, I'll be leaving a link to it down below for you to go ahead and check out. The first question being that Jason Schreier asks, you mentioned parents finding charges from their kids suddenly showing up on their credit card bills. That can happen a lot with microtransactions that aren't loot boxes. Why focus specifically on loot boxes? Senator Holly replies, both loot boxes and pay to win. We think the reason why is that it's foremost addiction development. It's an attempt for kids to, as I said before, add in casinos to kids games in an attempt to get them hooked in an attempt to exploit them. We don't allow actual casinos to exploit children this way. Why should we allow the gaming industry to do so? These C-suite executives who, who are driving this trend. The next question also asks, why focus specifically on children? Can't adults also be exploited by these casinos? Senator Holly replies, adults can for sure be exploited. I think that children, there are a couple of things that, as we know, in a variety of contexts, whether it's casinos proper or public health issues, we often look at kids and say they're uniquely vulnerable. They don't necessarily know the nature of these microtransactions, being on the lookout for them in the way that an adult might. And while I realize that these microtransactions, these particular kinds, compromise the integrity of the game no matter who is subject to them, there's something I think that's pretty unique to kids and the addiction angle I think is pretty unique to kids as well. So this is an area too where I think we out, ought to be able to come together on a bipartisan basis and say, look, when you're directing this sort of pro-addiction activity, pro-addiction behavior toward children or practices toward children, we ought to be able to say no to that. Schreier asks, have you been in conversations with the ESA, the video games lobbyist group, or any other video game companies about how this might impact them? Yes, we have. Schreier asks, can you describe the nature of those conversations? Senior policy advisor Jacob Reese's, uh responds, this is Jacob here. I think it's fair to say the industry has concerns about this. We've been trying to be very transparent with them, but there may be a difference of opinion. Jacob's being very diplomatic, <laughs> Senator Holly mentions. It is worth noting that shortly after the announcement of the bill gaining bipartisan support for it has been announced. The ESA did provide a statement saying that this legislation is flawed and riddled with inaccuracies. It does not reflect how video games work nor how our industry strives to deliver innovative and compelling entertainment experiences to our audiences. The impact of this bill will be far-reaching and ultimately prove harmful to the player experience, not to mention the more than 220,000 Americans employed by the video game industry. We encourage the bill's co-sponsors to work with us to raise awareness about the tools and information in place to keep the control of video game play and in-game spending in parents' hands rather than in the government's. Personally to me, that entire response is complete bullshit. Uh, it just, it sounds to me more like an elaborate plea to <laughs> please. It's almost like they're saying, Please, government, please don't pass the bill. We promise we'll be good. It's and, and just trying to shove all the blame on the parents' hands rather than accepting the fact that it's the gaming companies who are making these games and making them manipulative in the first place, okay? The gaming companies have, you know, said and, you know, promised uh, that they would actually regulate themselves in order to help make sure it doesn't get out of hand. But clearly, that hasn't happened. Clearly, uh, they are too greedy for their own good to actually keep their word about that. Uh, at which point it's simply too late for the gaming industry. They had their chance, they messed it up, and now the government's getting involved. Continuing with the interview though, Shrar asks, do you think you're getting somewhere? I've seen cynicism from financial analysts, from people in the game sphere, skepticism that this will actually pass. Certainly some concerns that this might just be a publicity stunt. Holly responds, I think if they thought it were a publicity stunt, they wouldn't be so concerned. I think the reaction of the corporate lobbyists sort of strongly suggests that they're very worried about this. I think it probably also suggests that they know this practice is not going to stand up to public scrutiny. Once parents really understand what's going on here, and once the general public understands how these games are being manipulated, how their integrity is being compromised, how basically these companies have found a way to make whole gobs of money without really being upfront about it, and of course the addictive nature of it, I think they're pretty worried that it's going to result in public backlash, and it should.
Shar asks, public backlash is one thing, but I can't imagine that many of your colleagues in Congress know enough or care about video games. Can this really get traction among those folks? Holly responds, I think everybody though cares about the health and safety of kids. And they also should care about this broader problem of what I've started calling the addiction economy, which this is a great example. We see this in other spheres, by the way. We see it in social media. We're seeing it here in the gaming industry, where you've got these corporations finding new ways to try to hook folks, extract personal information for them in the case of social media, extract money of them in the case of games, without regard to what that does to either in the case of gaming the game itself, and then to people's general health and well-being. So I think there's a lot of concern about that, and we hope to drive a conversation in this space. Shar asks, Republican philosophy is generally all about personal accountability. Microtransactions, nobody's forced to pay for them or buy loot boxes. Why not let the free market decide their fate? Holly responds, well, similarly, as with casinos, we don't allow children to go into casinos. We very carefully control, regulate what our children are exposed to. This is well within that model. This is something every parent should care about. And I actually don't think that exerting when people understand that what's essentially happening here is online gambling being inserted into these games, I think a concern about. Schreier says, but that's not what you're talking about here. Your bill also includes pay to win games, which are not gambling. They're paying for perks in a game. Holly says, similar though. Once again, it's a microtransaction that's not necessarily expected, especially from a child up front. And it is meant to induce obviously further playing, but also further is spending money. So it works in much the same way, I think. The same arguments would apply. Schreier asks, what would you say to a video game company that says, hey, without these things, you're going to cause us to crash, cause this entire industry to fold? Holly responds, these are very resourceful people, and I'm sure they can design games that don't rely on gambling directed at children in the center of games. So guys, that was it for today's video. Go ahead and let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comment section down below. This is a very interesting discussion and topic that I wish for everybody to be aware of and to talk about. Uh, personally for me, I really do hope that the bill passes just because of the fact that I personally am very sick and tired of this business model that's being spread across pretty much most uh, popular games these days. But other than that, if you enjoyed the video, please leave a like, subscribe, and hit that bell button. It's the best way I know when I upload more videos such as this one. My name is Brian from Kingdom Martin Cross Nation, and I will see you guys in the next video. Peace, guys.